Welcome to this Abundant Insight. Today, we have Gary Brooks. Gary is the president of FEI, and he is also a partner with McCracken Alliance Partners. I've known Gary for many years. He's got some amazing experience, and today he's going to share some of that experience with us, and I'm very excited to hear what story he has for us today. So today's case study with Gary begins now. Well, Gary, I'm looking forward to uh, our discussion about this this client. I know you worked with them uh, when you were a little bit younger, and uh, <laughs> been through uh, uh, a few experiences since then. But maybe you could tell us how you got uh, got started with this this company. Uh, it was actually my first job as a full time CFO. Very small company. Uh, I was employee number sixteen, I think, when I came on board. Uh, the most notable, notable thing that happened was that uh, two years later, we had about 400 people in the office. So uh, I didn't know that I knew how to manage growth, but I can tell you with some authority that I think I know how to manage growth, at least that during those times back a few years ago. So anyway, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, the company was a trading company in uh, petroleum products, and they had a small refinery down in Corpus Christi. And they had a whole bunch of transactions going on any given day. Uh, the, the, the issue I had as the CFO is that every transaction was in one guy's head. <laughs> and, and we knew that that just wouldn't, wasn't tolerable. If he got uh, hurt or gone or uh, just forgot something, uh, we could lose an awful lot of money. So um, uh, the CFO protecting the assets, I had to get some things done and so i was also extremely young so i didn't know i didn't know how to fix it so oh, well now did the uh, the person that had everything in their head did they see it the same way well they understood he was the marketing guy and i was the financial guy the uh the president was a very smart man uh he understood exactly what the situation was and and he had my full backing to try to get things uh, more orderly than they were. Okay. So in this situation, did you really need to do any kind of formal assessment or did you pretty much just eyeball it? Well, uh, I wasn't smart enough to do it in a formal way. <laughs> I just knew I just knew what we had was not going to be tenable. Uh, and I didn't know really know how to fix it. I, I didn't know how uh, to, to, to uh, come up with a plan and then show it to people and have them execute it and make sure that it gets done right. If I had done that, it probably wouldn't have worked because uh, there were just a lot of different people involved with transactions. And at the end of the day, it became very important that each of them knew, understood how what they did impacted other people in the, in the, in the company. Uh, okay. we, had a small ref we had a small refinery down in Corpus. We were producing things like diesel uh, and other uh, light ends and some other things, not gasoline because we weren't that sophisticated. We would sell off naphtha and we also were a res residual fuel oil trader. So we were doing a lot of uh, different kinds of things. Uh, but a typical series of transactions would include uh, loading a barge full of diesel out of the refinery, uh, taking the barge to Houston, put it in a pipeline, take the pipeline to Kansas, put it in a different pipeline, take that to Minnesota, and then uh, sell off the, the stuff in Minnesota in trucks. Now, the, the illogical thing about all of that is that none of it happened in sequence. It was happening kind of constantly as they were moving product around inside the company. And I wasn't nearly, and it involved a, a half dozen different people, one time or another, people at the refinery, people we call schedulers who schedule things into the barges and into the pipelines. And then the, the traders who were selling things and buying things. And we also uh, got involved with something called petroleum product exchanges, where we essentially just trade the product in one place for another place. Economics 101, time, place, quality. Uh, those were the reasons they'd be able to trade product. And uh, over time, we would do all of those kinds of things. But the thing I knew for sure is we didn't know how to keep track of all of that stuff. And I certainly didn't. And we would have all this paper coming from people uh, 
uh, there was evidence of things going into the pipeline, coming out of the pipeline, into the barge, out of the barge, into the uh, re documents coming out of, anyway, sales documents uh, to the ultimate uh, jobbers in Minnesota, that sort of thing. And this, the transactions I'm describing were one of about 30, 30 or 40 different types of transactions all going on at the same time. It was complicated. And so uh, not knowing how to fix it, I figured the best thing I needed to do was get everybody in one room and have them talk about it and uh, yeah. have come up with a way to, to, to keep track of it. And so you kind of had to put the people and the process somehow together to make it all work? What I told them to do is I, I got about a dozen people in the room, all of these various types of included accountants and credit people and cash managers, and things like that as well uh, as the operating people. I put them all in one room and said, look, we need a piece of paper that describes what you're doing. No matter what it is, we're dealing with salesmen who don't know how to write. So you have to have checkoff lists and things like that. So it has to be very simple, easy to do. And as you go through it, discuss it with the other people and understand what they need in order to make the decisions that they've got to make. Uh, for example, we had to check credit on new customers. Uh, we had to uh, uh, make sure uh, this gets extraordinarily complicated because um, all, bar all barrels were approximate. Uh, the actual barrels that actually moved out of a barge into a pipeline and that sort of thing the, the the quantities had to be measured and metered and that sort of thing and there's always a different 100,000 barrels might mean depending on what the temperature is in a gauge of, of a tank it might be 99 or 102,000 uh, barrels so it, it was a, a, a complicated deal um, so anyway I told them to come up with a piece of paper that described these transactions as they came we actually created a new accounting department called exchange accounting, put it kind of in the middle between the accounting people and the marketing people or the people doing the scheduling and stuff and had them gather all the paper as it came in from the outside and they would match it with this piece of paper that these guys came up with. And it was called a new deal sheet. And it kept that moniker for eight years after that. So, and it worked extraordinarily well, actually. Um, now it didn't it didn't work well from the first day it worked for about a month and then after uh about a month i found that people were yelling at each other in the halls over over something either missing or or uh, uh too much work to put on this quote new deal sheet and so uh i called another meeting and we had another meeting. I tore the piece of paper up and said, do it again. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't stay in the room when they did this. I left okay, because I didn't want to try to dominate what they were doing. I really wanted them to get to know what the other guys were doing. And, uh, and also, I, was, I have a lazy streak, so I didn't want to do all this stuff. But uh, anyway, they came, up, they came up with an extraordinarily good way to fix this. Uh, uh, that second sheet worked for about 30 days. And then uh, the same thing started happening. Things started breaking down and the people called their own meeting. They came back together. They revised the sheet again. And then I made a mistake. The mistake I, I made was not documenting this whole process once it got done. Uh, and I didn't do it. I didn't do it until the company sold a few years later. I had to do it to describe what we were doing to the buyer. And uh, it was, and it was a complex exercise because I didn't know how to do it. And I think I told you, Carl, that I went to the library actually, and I found an article written by some professor, I think at University of Michigan, on on something called um, matrix organization structure. And it's a very simple concept. It's basically matching people or departments and projects and figuring out who's involved on each project who's in charge of each piece of the project, and then um, uh, seeing how that, that works. I still use that technique constantly today. I don't write it down anymore because I've, <laughs> I've done it so much, I just think it that way. But it, it's extraordinarily effective and it did communicate exactly how we did things. Uh, anyway, that, that's a little bit, that's a quick story for a very complex process, frankly. 
uh, as a result of that, the good news is, as a result of that, our revenues, our monthly revenues went from about $5 million a month to about $120 million a month over that 20 months. And that's why we grew so fast. Uh, well, the more transactions we had, the more people we had to have to keep track of it. And uh, uh, it was a really good set, good group of people. Uh, the, the, very smart. They bought into the project. The president was great because he kind of enforced making sure that we were doing it right. And he got familiar enough with the process to, uh, to help do it. I wish we would have had your tool that you're producing now. It probably would have been a, 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 a little bit simpler to put all that together. But uh, I know it, I lost a lot of sleep over it for the first couple of months trying to get that done. But anyway. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent story. Yeah, it, it does a number of things resonate with uh, me and the approach that we use with the abundant tools, the abundant framework in terms of, um, you know, organizing the people and matching that with the processes, developing that flow. Um, your point about not being in that meeting, it's not so, you know, whether you were in the meeting or not, but you you didn't position yourself as I have all the answers. No. You're like, tell me what we need to do. So you were listening. So that's another very fundamental par uh, part of the abundant approach. So well, yeah. it wasn't like it wasn't like I ignored everything that they went through. I actually went through the document in a lot of detail with the individuals that are in the room to understand how they were going to distribute it and who put what down and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, just to get make sure that I understood at least what the fundamentals were so that, uh, for example, there weren't any internal control issues or anything like that, that that uh, accountants and CFOs tend to worry about. Uh, but uh, uh, we had the, uh, the accounting and treasury people uh, directly involved with all of it. And uh, it, it really seemed to work. I was, uh, I was very happy with the turnout. Uh, now, keep in mind, by the way, there was no internet. <laughs> okay. There were no fax machines. Mm -hmm. This was before fax machines came to play. It was back in the 70s. And, and they didn't really come into play into the early 80s. We actually wound up uh, buying a couple of machines that Exxon had bought a company called Quip, Q-U-I-P. It was a drum uh, uh, mounted device, much like the Thomas Edison versions of the, of the phonograph uh, that would cut one piece of paper at a time, took about 30 minutes. And, and, and we put, uh, I put uh, a full-time clerk, it, both in Corpus and in Houston, where we, the, the key here was getting shipping documents so we could build in Houston and keep track of everything. Um, wow. And it uh, and it worked beautifully. Uh, it, it just, I can't say enough about it. And the, a whole lot of it was because each of the people that were involved in that room understood what the whole process was about. Uh, and they understood how what they did impacted everybody else in the company. And right. if they and if they forgot, they would get reminded <laughs> by these by the other people pretty quickly if it doesn't work. But it, it really worked really kind of magically. And, and oh, by the way, uh, cash management was a big big item back in those days. It was in the Jimmy Carter days, bless his heart, uh, 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 of uh, uh, prime rates of somewhere between eighteen and twenty two percent. So cash management was a huge factor in this whole process. One billing day on a $3 million sale uh, was, was worth flying somebody to New York or Philadelphia to cash a check a day early and have them wire the phone. Anyway, it was just lots of little things that we did to, to manage that process. Sorry, I yeah. didn't mean to, don't mean to digress too much. No, that's it. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, I've, um, I think uh, my first job at a office was uh you know in the very early 80s and you know the uh yeah fa early fax machines and some of the very first uh pcs were coming out and you know we just it wasn't too distant removed from slide rules so uh, <laughs> 
Well, I can actually multiply and divide on an adding machine. So <laughs> that's a part of that history too. It's difficult. It's as difficult as it sounds like it would be, but uh, right. there is a way to do it on that's old machines. But, uh, but it sounds like a lot of, you know, you gained a lot from that experience. Uh, you know, the your, your matrix process uh, approach was something it seems like you've used many times since then. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And now that the last 20 years I've spent as an interim CFO. So I kind of walk into a company cold and have to evaluate a lot of things very, very quickly. And, and uh, I've got a whole series of questions that are embedded in my head that go through uh, uh, the processes fairly quickly. And I'm always thinking in terms of those matrix matrix charts mm -hmm. to see who's involved, who's not involved, who should be involved, that sort of thing. And it, it helps tremendously in uh, in going through to figure out what the key uh, problems with a with a company are. Um, yes. And yeah, that's uh, what what the high process. priority what the, what the high pri highest priorities are for the company. Absolutely. Yeah. We uh, uh, we certainly encourage that with the uh, with our tools. We we see that as a very important piece, and so we help guide people on that as well. So appreciate that. All right. Good. Any other lessons learned from that uh, experience that you'd like to share? Well, I can tell you that I made about as many mistakes as anybody could make in a five-year period. Um, I did make a lot. I did do a lot of dumb things that I've learned from. Uh, fortunately, I have a good enough memory not to make too many of them twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I learned a whole lot about how to manage people and how to uh, just get things done, how to deal with banks, how to deal with insurance and risk management, uh, because a lot of that stuff was completely new to me at the time. And I uh, had, no, had no clue. And I, I managed to really mess it up a couple of times. And uh, uh, one time, for example, um, I found out that there was only one underwriter in the United States who would insure refineries the size of our refinery. Wow. And I decided we might change agents. So I signed a document I shouldn't have signed. And so all of a sudden the, the underwriter got two proposals from two different agents and said, eh, they just threw them in the trash and went away. They said, oh my, you know, now I'm in trouble <laughs> because, because we, had, we actually had to, had to sit down and meet pay for them to come down from, I think, Chicago, wherever they were based, and, and come down and, and, and beg forgiveness and just tell them I was did a, made a mistake and uh, how can we fix it. As it turned out, we had one of the safest refineries in the country, so it, was, it wasn't like somebody that didn't want to do it. It's just we didn't follow the protocols properly, right. and uh, I didn't follow the protocols properly and uh, learned an important lesson there. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well. Live and learn. Well, uh, it sounds like you survived that and uh, didn't make that mistake again. Not too many bullet holes. All right. That's great. <laughs> well, Gary, I appreciate you spending some time and sharing some of your wisdom and experience with us. Um, very much appreciated. Well, I hope it's helpful to you and whoever listens to this. So anyway. Excellent. Thank you.